It was after reading The New Earth, I then read The Power of Now, and then I decided that I wanted to share this type of thinking to others. Um, I think sometimes books can be a bit theoretical for people, so I wanted to make a film where people talked about their experiences. When I started to practice being in the present, I, um, I would tell myself, but how can I be a, a complete human being if I'm not thinking about what's going to happen in the future or what has happened in the past, it, it is who I am. But then I realized that life really is uh, being, it's living in the present. That's how life is meant to be lived, not in the future. And because those are things that don't exist, they're just fictitious. Eckhart's teachings are based around presence and how the human mind tends to really associate and live in the past as well as the, uh, the future. So anywhere but the now, uh, he says that is not associated with our true self. It only comes from the mind and the ego and the part of ourselves that are um, you know, programmed through our lives in, in a certain way. When you're living in the future all the time, the, the, the present moment is never enough. So it's always getting to the next thing that's more important to you than this moment. So it could be anything. I mean, even, even on my wedding day, I think I was kind of, you know, whatever stage of the wedding we were at, I was looking to get to the next bit. And you miss out on those, those special moments. You're not tuned into what's happening right, the isness of this moment, you're not tuned into that. You're tuned in and you're used to and you've, you're conditioned that way to be looking to the next thing. What can I get out of the next moment? How can I make the next moment better? I think that's why I was living in a, a, general, a general feeling of discontent. And still do you know, a fair amount of the time, because you, you don't realise you're always looking for the next thing. So this moment isn't good enough. I used the book during that week from the discovery of the cancer on Monday to the actual diagnosis on Friday. Um, I used the book to stay in the now. I stayed really intensely in the now because it was very fearful and very traumatic um, or very frightening. And um, it was such a huge help to stay in the now. And even though I was very scared, there were also during that week moments of just real true happiness just real, it just bubbled up. And I just remember sitting there on the sofa, watching a movie with my husband thinking, wow, this is just so wonderful. This is just, I'm so in the now. We were, you know, cuddling, holding hands, you know, eating some popcorn. It was just wonderful. And I thought how strange to have cancer and be in fear and yet have these moments of just pure happiness. I was very, very ambitious and I was working on a strategy for my company at the time and I was very gung-ho about it. And I discovered in that week that love is the most important thing. Family, friends, the people you love, and staying in the now. My outlook on life changed and I started to drop some of the things I thought were important like this, this importance of money and success and job, uh, um, job progression. I rose the career ladder as a psychologist and became a consultant psychologist. I, I decided to leave the NHS and pursue a different life. 
and I started to find who, who I sort of really was. So I still work with traditional therapeutic approaches, um, but I find that more and more people who discover Eckhart's teachings are wanting to explore and find the true reality of who they are. It's really freedom from the prison of the egoic, false self, the egoic identity. There's always this resistance. And I've now come to find that that was the ego, but I didn't know at the time. And so in uncovering my pain body, I was able to then find out that I was in my pain body a lot of the time. Um, growing up, I'd always felt like, you know, I had to be the quote unquote perfect child. Um, I had to comply, I had to be a good child. And so because of that, I then um, felt that I needed to be good in everything that I did. And so I found it very hard just to be. At the same time, I studied another book, The Artist's Way by Julia Cameron. So essentially you journal every morning. And through the journaling, I was really able to be in the now and write about what was coming up for me in terms of my ego. And that really helped me transcend into a place where I was able to not only recognise the ego, but just be more compassionate and more loving with myself. And as a result, I've now been able to be more compassionate and more loving to others. Um, I used to find it very hard to forgive people. People had to be really, really, really sorry in order for me to forgive them. Whereas now, it's just kind of like we make mistakes. I think I had a lot of anger towards my mother. And, um, but I think it was probably so repressed that I didn't even know it was there. So somehow, I think that was a really, really good thing the diagnosis of the uh, cirrhosis, because, it could, okay, well, if, whether I live or whether I die soon, I have to resolve this. So I think that sets the motion in process and maybe coming across Eckhart Tolle's work was one of the steps in that, but that has made a huge difference. I held on to a lot of issues in the past, and when you read The Power of Now, you know, basically it says, that's it, you, you're just carrying the past with you, and then you allow it to, to affect or even to destroy your present, whereas the present is not bad, you don't have these problems now, but because they are in your mind and in the ego that you build and that story, oh, you know, I had a bad relationship with my mother and blah, blah. And this is all because of this. That is actually blighting the present moment. You know, may maybe the ego needs that drama to keep alive, to create that ongoing feeding. One of the very important changes that have happened is that development of the awareness that now this is the pain body, you know, waking up. This is before I had, I had no awareness at all. Before it was the idea, okay, so-and-so got on my nerves, so righteously I am angry about this, and that is the fault of that person who made me angry. <laughs> but I think, well, I suppose the awareness is rooted in, in being able to open up the space to observe yourself. I felt like I was suffering a lot as I was growing up. I felt very socially anxious, very... Like, the thoughts of, like, I would just constantly be projecting myself onto other people watching me. So I was just very scared to, like, move or to interact or to do anything. And, um, you know, secretly behind closed doors, I was always into this kind of thing. I even got into it through, like, uh, quantum physics at one point because there was a CIA paper called The Gateway Project that kind of explained this in a scientific way. And that kind of led me to seeking. But sometimes the me can take that as, like, you know, I'm trying to reach something, I'm trying to reach enlightenment, I'm trying to gain this awareness, but there's truly nothing to gain. It already is. 
So it's not like there's a separate me that's like re gonna reach this. There's actually nobody to reach this. This is already emptiness. This is already wholeness appearing as a me trying to reach this. Eckhart Tolle basically make uh, this all suffering as a healing. And then I start to heal uh, that thing and then uh, as soon as I, I start to read every chapter, every paragraph, everything is like a knots are opening now. Uh, the things are going uh, uh, smooth, more clear, more confident, and I'm perceiving this whole world as entirely different world. What happened after what I call the awakening event, uh, I was very blissed out and very in awe of the whole thing and feeling magical, wonderful, full of love. And I didn't even care that I had cancer at that point. I just, I was happy and I said, if I only have three months to live, this is amazing that I'm able to live for three months like this. So. It went on for, I don't know, maybe two or three days that I felt this way. Every morning at about five o'clock, went out on the balcony with my tea and listened to the birds sing and I was just blissed out the whole time. Weeks and months later, the fear was still gone. The fear was, never came back and to this, this day it's gone. There have been small moments of fear that flared up a little bit, you know, um, my operation didn't go so well. Uh, my right arm was, you know, pretty ruined. I wasn't able to use it or move it. it. I was in a lot of pain. I had my drainages in for almost eight weeks. Um, it was difficult. And, and then again, I had to go into a small acceptance, surrender. And it was a little fear, a little bit of like a flare up of fear. But as soon as I went into acceptance and surrender again, it was gone. I also made a lot of switches during that time. Like I switched from being so analytical and trying to figure everything out and reading millions of books to going inward and trusting my inner voice, trusting a f more of the feeling than the voice in my head. When I read the post about how Alicia was going through what she was going through and yet was so happy and so blissful, it just awakened something in me. I'm like, how can it be that this person has what I fear the most <laughs> in the world, and yet she's so happy, and I am not, and I don't have anything. And so I, um, I went around and I read all her posts, and um, it gave me the courage for the first time ever. I usually don't write stuff on, on communities because I'm kind of a bit shy. I kind of think I don't want to say the wrong things. But it gave me that courage, and I wrote about my struggles. It's part of you know, the, the work that I was doing on myself that, okay, let me share. It could, I could help someone or someone could help me. And I shared it, and then Alicia replied. And then we became such good friends. She's helped me so much in the recovery journey. I had what I'd always wanted to have in terms of, you know, having my own practice, doing my own thing, doing the things that I wanted to do. I, I had a, a wonderful family, a fantastic husband. I have a fantastic husband, wonderful children, all off to college at the peak of my career. And then I just um, uh, went through severe debilitating health anxiety. Now, looking back, there were always red flags. I was a bit overly concerned about my health. I needed to check everything out. And being a doctor, that was surrounded by colleagues who could do what I, what I requested them to do at any time and with gadgets all over, it was easy for me to keep on checking. Um, at the time, it really crept up on me. I kept on reinforcing the anxiety by checking everything till I stopped even believing the test, I stopped believing the doctors, I stopped believing anything 
that uh, pointed to my good health and doubted everything. And I really went down a deep, dark hole. I like to say that I don't want to say that I've healed, even though at the time, way back in January, if you had told me that now, this is where I would be, I would have told you this is all I would ever want. But I keep on hitting new highs. I keep on hitting new highs. It's, it's a, a, a kind of feeling that I never thought was possible. When uh, uh, my faith, my belief system, and every, everyone else around me was telling me, you know, it's possible to kind of just be blissfully happy. I didn't believe it. I thought this would never happen. Every other aspect of my life now, it's, it's almost like an upgrade. The upgrade about everything is about my relationship with others, my relationship with my family, my relationship with life, with food, with, with sleep, with everything. It has changed for the better. And um, I am more carefree. I don't have that control. I just let go, like, like um, just surrender and say, you know, let the universe unfold, you know, surprise me. Rather than looking at it with dread, I'm looking at it with excitement and optimism. And I think that makes a whole lot of difference. The pain body for me would be usually come out in an angry anger about all sorts of things. But that was my insecurity that was inside and probably back from childhood and, and me early adult life, you know. So all of that insecurity comes out when somebody triggers it. He's again giving you the opportunity to watch it and being with it and just giving some space to it so that it doesn't just come out as an outburst, trying to live up to an image and trying to just con constantly get more and more and more. That was not going to make me happy, you know, um, and it wasn't going to it was going to prevent me from being a good father, you know, so I had to stop. My wife and my relation was never before which is now. We have been so up and down because of uh, uh, many social, economic or personal uh, problems. But when I come across to the Eckhart Tolle's works, then that started to reflect on myself as a changed person, but also reflect on my wife's life. And from there hence it reflect directly all and many things indirectly on my children. So then we as a family ready to accept truth and uh, ready to change. Non-reacting, he says any kind of reaction is a non-acceptance of what is happening. So something is happening, for example, it's raining. I'm not saying I like it or I enjoy it, but that's what it is. I don't react to it. And it is the same, I think, with behaviors with other people. I used to be very reactive towards behaviors of people close to me. So then I realized, you know, the more you react, the more you feed their pain body as well, and mine. So in a way, I, I really like the idea. The idea is you don't do anything. You just stop reacting. I think a lot of my anger towards my mother was rooted in the idea that she knew what she was doing and it was deliberate. And if you, I suppose, if you attribute volition, you know, if you say, oh, she knew what she was doing, then obviously there is, it makes you more angry. But on the other hand, some people are genuinely unable to, you know, to break out of the wall they have built. You know, they built it and then they can't pull it down. I think. So I think that's how I came to feel compassion for her. The role that somebody is meant to play in your life, I think a lot of us have, you know, certain 
expectations around intimacy and around love and around, you know, romance in, in a way. So for me, it's an ongoing process of presence and detaching a certain expectation of the future. And, you know, Eckhart always says that an idea of something being forever is, is only the mind's, you know, creation. And I think a lot of us struggle a lot with that. And, you know, when we, when we meet someone, a friend or romantic partner or a business partner, we, we, we have all these expectations of the future of that person's role in our lives, which actually takes us away from fully being present with them now. That sense of me, whenever it appears to come out, it's based in fear, it's based in uh, suffering, it's based in attachment, it's based in all these emotions that feel uncomfortable because it's not natural to us to cling on to these things and that's why when we try, it's like we're, we're chasing our own tail with it. The commentary is uh, less abrupt, <laughs> it's just kind of like it's seen for what it is. There was a distance that came. It was if I was looking at the problem and it was not inside me anymore. It was the cancer and it was here and I could look at it kind of in a neutral sort of way. And I felt as if I was packed in cotton. They seemed to be these soft pink clouds and I was kind of packed in it as if everything was a little bit translucent. It felt very comfortable to be able to just look at my problem in a neutral way. And slowly but surely this peace started arising. And I wasn't doing anything at that point. I was just sitting with it and accepting and surrendering. Even I can't tell you how you surrender, you just you just do. I think you 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 let your heart chakra open and you sit with it and you say, okay. You say okay to the universe. It's all right. I'm ready. I can do this. I can die. And um, this peace just rose. It was just this beautiful, beautiful peace. And it got stronger and stronger as I sat with it. And um, I remember after, I don't, need, I don't know if it was 15, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, I'm not sure. Um, but what came behind that, it's like it rose within me. And behind it came, after that, bliss. <laughs> I mean, literally bliss. And I said to myself, this is crazy. I mean, I cannot have cancer and know I'm going to die and be peaceful and blissful too. That makes no sense. <laughs> I had read about Eckerd's experience. Um, and I was very impressed by it. But the last thing I thought would happen is that I would also have an experience that was somehow similar. But because it was described so well in the book, it was as if I was able to do it intuitively. I mean, I didn't do anything, but it was as if I was able to guide this process. And then it just took over by itself, of its own accord. It blew me away. I didn't really know what to think about it. And I remember thinking, well, that's okay. I mean, Eckhart had this experience too. You know, you, you know that it exists. But of course, my mind was there saying, this is crazy. <laughs> this makes no sense. We spoke about how we would then be better friends to each other. Um, but before, what I would have done is I would have taken the ego into that relationship and I would have said, you have done this, you are a bad friend, you need to be a better friend to me, rather than actually saying, I love you, you are my friend, I don't understand what's going on, um, do you still want this relationship to continue and what do I need to do as well as you in order to help this relationship to continue to grow? It's about learning that in every situation, the most important thing is to bring compassion to it, to bring love to it, and just allowing people to love me back and understand that even in those situations, ego will come up for them and understand that it's just them wanting to protect, protect themselves. And they, it doesn't, it's not nothing against me. It's just what's happening in the moment. Before reading this book, I, everything, any thought that came in my head is pretty much to be believed, you know? Any judgment that comes up. 
but I think even even taking a step back from all the negative thoughts that you have, it's also practicing even the, the the positive thoughts that come up. You know, that's not all to be believed. You know, I think it has to be whatever the mind is saying. It's a pinch of salt. You know, you've got to be gentle with it as well, and uh, like. Like a little puppy, you know, that's sort of misbehaving. It's that type of relationship, I think. You wouldn't mistreat a puppy either. You wouldn't scream and shout at it. and You wouldn't throw it out onto the street. You'd just kind of gently, come on, you know, bring it back, you know. You know what I mean? It's that kind of, I think that seems to be the best way to, to treat it. That, that's the most helpful. Rather, you can't be berating yourself having certain thoughts either. That's, that's going to have a negative effect as well, I think. As a psychologist, I spent a career working with clients and I can look back and smile now because the whole of Western therapy is based upon working with what Eckhart would call the false self or the ego self. And there's only so much you can do with that false self. You can't make it whole. So it is a false self, it's a creation of the mind. Say that sentence, I can no longer live with myself. In that sentence, there's two selves, right? There's the I, which is your true self, which is you know, you beyond the mind, and with myself, I cannot live with myself. The self is the mind, you know? So that really just, to me, that sentence shows the duality of our mind and our self and how, how separate they are. But it's so difficult to uh, detach the two and to not identify with our mind and sometimes the harmful thoughts that are happening. And if we can be in the present where we're not thinking about the past and we're not thinking about what we're going to do in the future, we can truly be here and be with ourselves and also with the people that we love and, you know, earth and nature and, you know, just the things that are actually beautiful in the present moment. I was a redhead and I was always very proud of this this red hair um, and I would have never cut it never had short hair and now I lost all my hair um, lost my eyelashes lost my eyebrows and now it's all grown back in and when my hair started growing back in it was kind of like a dirty dishwater blonde and then I started thinking about rethinking my clothing and so um, I started moving into a new image and having fun with it um, and I think it's okay because, you know, the form doesn't matter that much and yet you can have fun with it. I went through um, surgery. Like I said, it wasn't an easy surgery and it was quite large. I also went through radiation and um, I was also supposed to be taking anti-hormone pills, but I stopped taking them because they made me quite ill. And I'm tired of being, you know, ill in some way. So I'm finished with my treatment and it looks like everything's good. But the thing is, is that cancer is a tricky thing, especially my form of cancer. It, it could come back. It could flare up again. You just never know. But now that I've had this awakening event now that my life has changed so drastically because of this because of what's happened um, I just I'm okay with it I I can live with that it's like what Eckhart Tolle says live with a knife over your head you know he quoted some master live with a knife over your head and I do that that's how I live now and it's okay for me I don't mind I don't go to my checkups and think, oh, what's going to happen, what are they going to say? Um, I go to my checkups and I'm completely calm. It's, it's a beautiful thing. It's, it's the greatest gift. <laughs> it's like going to point zero 
and it's like before all the conditioning came in, before all the voices and all the suffering came in, you kind of see that it's just illusory. And of course that creates a lot of peace because you're no longer stuck or like heavy with all this baggage of me. It's really easy for the mind to take over and to, for the ego to take over. So it's an ongoing process of watching your mind, but also in a, in a neutral way. And realizing that it's all right, actually, you know, it's, there's nothing wrong. There's nothing missing. It's okay. You know, and, and being happy enough with that. I still have my moments, I still have setbacks, but now I have a different relationship with the setbacks. Rather than engage with the content of the thought and say, okay, I need to check this out. I, need to, I tell myself, oh, this is a setback. This means I still have some more work to do in diffusing whatever it is that's coming up. And I, I go back and I do it. I'm like, I'm grateful for that. <clears throat> if not, that energy is going to be just stored in my body and just creating havoc there. So I'm glad that the energy is coming up so that I can now just take it out. I think now I've been the happiest I've ever been. Even though, you know, I've got mobility problems, I've got diabetes, I've got this and that. But I, I think, you know, when the heart is content, it doesn't matter. The, the externals are not, are not important anymore. I think I'm happy. No, I think I'm sure I'm happier than I have been when I was younger. So, so I think that is, a, that is an achievement. I guess you could say I've gotten a jump start um, because of the cancer and the acceptance and then the peace that passes all understanding. So you could say that it catapulted me forward, um, but it's, I'm still on the path. I've still just taken the first steps and I'm still learning as well, just as the rest of the people who are following the teachings. So I struggle with that a little bit with being seen as somebody who's enlightened or awakened because that's not the case. Um, and wanting to get my message out and wanting to give others hope and let others know this stuff really exists. It's real. It's I've experienced it. I was there. I know what he's talking about. It's such an important message and um, and like Eckhart would say, I'm not the teacher. You just, you can go and you can figure it out for yourself. You can find it in you. We all have it. I'm proof of that. Once you're connected with yourself, you have a real concept of being connected with others because Eckhart talks about this whole idea of we're all being one, we're all of one and those concepts also come up in the Bible as well. So because understanding that what I do to myself, I do to you, then I, I'm, that's why I must be kinder to myself, that's why I must be um, more loving and more compassionate to myself and as a result I'm more loving and more compassionate to you because what I do affects you and vice versa. And so that's what I've learned from it, it's just really the power of, of self, but then also self in the sense that we're all one. I become more spiritual, more closer to God. You can call that God Allah, you can call that God God or Ishwar or uh, uh, whatever, but main thing is there there is a, a consciousness there is a being and we are part of that